Welcome back to the channel. This week we're going to cover common paediatric infections. This is a bugbear for a lot of trainees and does crop up from time to time during the exams and you'll undoubtedly come across this during your career. Before we begin though, we should cover the nice traffic light criteria for a febrile child. It's a good starting point to use when taking a history and assessing an unwell child, particularly in those younger than 5 years old. So, the NICE traffic light system is based on depending if a child is green, amber or red, and splits it up into colour, behaviour, circulation and extra points. A child that is deemed green would look normal in colour, the behaviour would be normal with smiling, happy children, with a strong cry and they'll be alert. The breathing will be normal, their skin and the mucous membranes will appear hydrated, and there won't be any red or amber signs. A child who is amber would appear pale in colour, their behaviour, they won't necessarily respond to normal cues, they might be a bit more sleepier than normal, more irritable with decreased activity. With their breathing, they might be tachypneic with saturations less than 95% and the chest may have added sounds. In terms of circulation, they might be tachycardic, have reduced capillary refill, mucous membranes may also appear quite dry and they may not have much of a urine output and reduce feeding. Other amber points include a child between 3 to 6 months with a temperature above 39 degrees or a fever above 5 days. Children in rigors or joint or limb swelling, or if they're unable to weight bear, are also amber signs. A child deemed red, however, would look pale or mottled. They'll look seriously unwell, they might be drowsy or have a very weak cry. Breathing wise, they might be in respiratory distress with some grunting, tachypnea, or chest in drawing. And from a circulation viewpoint, they may look dehydrated or have a reduced skin turgor. Other points might include a child with a fever under the age of 3 months and above 38 degrees. They may have a non-blanching rash or neurological signs such as seizures or a bulging fontanelle. In essence, a febrile child that is deemed green, appropriate manners should be given at home with clear safety netting. If the child is deemed amber, there may be a possibility to treat this patient at home with clear follow-up and a low threshold to referral to secondary care. If a febrile child is deemed red, they really should be managed by the acute paediatric team. A nice also advice to avoid antibiotics unless you have a clear source of infection. Now that we've covered that, let's focus on some of the hot topics for exams. The following, however, isn't an exhaustive list, but does cover a lot of the common childhood presentations. Starting with bronchiolitis. This is typically caused by the respiratory syncytial virus. It's commonly a condition seen in children younger than 12 months, typically causing lower respiratory tract infections in the wintertime. They may have chorizal symptoms such as a dry cough, shortness of breath with associated feeding issues, and children often have a fever and some wheezing as well. Nice of clear supportive guidance in terms of assessment and management with emergency admission considered, particularly if any of the following are present. Signs such as respiratory distress or apneic episodes, cyanosis, saturations less than 92%, if the child is systemically unwell, or if there's any signs of reduced oral intake or dehydration, or if the tachypnea with a respiratory rate above 60. Management usually revolves around conservative care, with oxygen and fluid restoration key, as well as optimising feeding. Croup this is a common viral respiratory tract infection caused by the para-influenza virus, which often causes a stridor-like sensation in children between 6 and 36 months typically. This often presents as a classic barking cough, often at night with mild fever and stridor. NICE also strategizes this into mild, moderate and severe symptoms. Mild symptoms include occasional symptoms with no other red or amber flag symptoms. Moderate cases include frequent cough with stridor, but no distress and the child is systemically well. And severe features include a frequent cough, stridor or systemic compromise. Treatment is often conservative, but NICE CKS advise the use of oral dexamethasone as a single dose of 0.15 mg per kilo to all children with croup regardless of mild, moderate or severe, with oxygen and nebulized adrenaline used in emergency situations. Impetigo Impetigo is a bacterial skin infection typically caused by Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes with most presentations occurring around the face or exposed skin. It often presents as a crusted golden skin-like lesions that is quite contagious. 
NICE now recommend the use of hydrogen peroxide 1% cream in patients with localised disease in an attempt to avoid antibiotic resistance. Topical antibiotics such as fusidic acid are also an alternative. Significant disease is often treated with oral fucloxacillin. With regards to schooling, exclusion is advised until 48 hours after antibiotic treatment or if all the lesions are healed. Whooping cough. This is typically caused by the border telepatasis bacteria, with children often having chorizal respiratory tract symptoms with subsequent paroxysmal coughing bouts that often end up in a vomiting episode or a cyanotic episode. This is interspersed with inspiratory whoops. There is advice to attempt PCR or serology for a diagnosis, however, treatment is often considered prior to the results with macrolides first line, as well as household contacts being offered treatment. In terms of school exclusion, children are advised to avoid school until 48 hours after starting antibiotics. It's also a notifiable disease, so you need to let Public Health England know. Scarlet fever. This is a bacterial infection caused by group A streptococcus, typically pyogenes. It's commonly seen around children of 4 years old with fever, sore throat and upper respiratory tract symptoms, followed by a classic strawberry tongue and a scarletina rash. The rash itself is usually erythematous, starting first typically on the torso and is sandpaper-like in texture. Some cases even end up with desquamation of the skin, typically on the hands and feet. Again, it's a notifiable disease, so Public Health England need to know. Severe cases can often lead to complications, including otitis media, as well as rarely rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. Diagnosis requires a throat swab, but oral penicillin V for 10 days is usually commenced with school exclusion advised for 24 hours after antibiotics are commenced. Hand, foot and mouth syndrome. This is commonly caused by the Coxsackie virus. Patients often have a sore throat, fever and oral ulcers, with small vesicles subsequently appearing on the palmar surface of the hands and the soles of the feet. Outbreaks typically happen at nurseries, with management often self-limited with conservative advice. There is no school exclusion necessary. Roseola infantum. This is also known as a sixth disease and is caused by the human herpes virus 6, HHV6, which presents in young children with high fever and classic Nagiyama spots, which are papules on the uvula and soft palate. Although it's self-limiting, patients may, in serious cases, develop febrile convulsions, meningitis and hepatitis. Management is often conservative, with no school exclusion necessary. Chickenpox. This often starts as a febrile illness with a subsequent pruritic rash on the body that usually starts on the head or torso. The rash eventually becomes quite vesicular. Some rare but serious complications can occur, including pneumonia and encephalitis, with immunocompromised and neonatal patients often managed with immunoglobulins if exposed or IV acyclovir if the rash appears. Otherwise, management is often conservative with itch avoidance and a calamine lotion. However, school exclusion is advised until all lesions are dry and crusted over. Erythema infectiosum. This is known as fifth disease or slap cheek syndrome and is commonly caused by the parvovirus B19. It presents as non-specific lethargy, fever and a rash predominantly on the cheeks before moving to the arms. Children often have an asymptomatic reoccurrence of the rash, often months later, usually triggered by sunlight or heat. Management is often conservative, with no school exclusion necessary once the rash has appeared, given it is not infective in the presence of the rash. Measles. Recently, there's been a lot of new outbreaks given the poor uptake of the MMR vaccine in recent years. There's often a prodromal period of fever and conjunctivitis, with the rash often starting behind the ears and spreading globally. Also, there's a presence of coplic spots, which are pathognomic white spots seen in the mucosa of the mouth. Management is often conservative, but complications such as otitis media, pneumonia, encephalitis, and subacute sclerosing panencephalitis are relatively rare. The MMR vaccine should be offered to children exposed to measles if they've not been vaccinated already. And in terms of school exclusion, it's four days from the onset of rash. It's also a notifiable disease. Mumps. Mumps classically presents as a non-specific fever, malaise and associated muscular pain and myalgia. 
There's common parotitis, which is often a key feature here, usually bilateral, with patients complaining of painful eating. Given the poor uptake of MMR, unfortunately there are rising cases, with severe complications including orchitis, hearing loss and encephalitis. If necessary, school exclusion is five days from the onset of swollen glands. And rubella. Thankfully, this is quite rare. However, you do need to know that it presents as a classical suboccipital and postauricular lymphadenopathy associated with a macular papilla rash on the face and the body. For your exams, you need to know the school exclusion criteria, so it's five days from the onset of the rash. And that is that. There is a lot to take in above, and I hope this provides a good overview of most of the common infections seen in children. Again, always follow your local guidance when treating these, but this should give you some foundations for your exam. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give us a follow on Instagram, at dorky underscore docs. We've got regular revision material, as well as a growing community on Facebook. Be sure to like and subscribe, and share it amongst your colleagues. It really does help the channel grow. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video, and good luck with your exams.